And uh, with that, why don't, why don't we just take a second? I, I want to pray for us and, of course, welcome those of you guys watching online right now from coast to coast and across the Fruited Plains. My name is Joe. I'm the pastor at Lynchburg City Church. And if God should put it on your heart to give to the church, you can do so by going to lynchburgcitychurch.com. And why don't you just take a second, if you would, pray with me, guys. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for rescuing us, God. We owe you everything. You are truly a holy God. Lord, for President Biden, I pray that you'd give him wisdom and grace, that you'd help him, Lord, as he finishes out his term in office. Lord, for all of our leaders, please help them, God. Whether we like them or not, as as 1 Timothy 2 reminds us, to, to be praying for them, so we need to be. For our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardsmen, uh, those serving in the space force both at home and abroad, we pray for their safety, we pray for their protection, and we pray that you would save them because many of them do not know you. Many of them do not know you. For the persecuted church, for Leah Sherabu being held by Boko Haram in Nigeria, for the Christians, Lord, in China, in North Korea, in Indonesia, for the Christians, Lord, in Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, in Somalia, in Eritrea, in the South Sudan, in Nigeria, in some of the the most difficult places on the planet to be a Christian, we pray that you would help them. As the author of Hebrews tells us to remember those who are in chains as if in chains with them, God, please help them. Please help them, Jesus. For Jason Cheesegel and his family, for, for my friend Jason, Lord, and his family, um, in the jungles, boots on the ground. In Papua New Guinea, in the jungles there, uh, serving among the Wabaku people, I I pray, Lord, that you would help them, that you would give them um, encouragement, that you would protect them from discouragement, Lord, and that the gospel would be proclaimed powerfully there this week. And for our good friend Graham, as he travels to Europe today, watch over him and protect him, Lord, and help him to be a light to so many lost. Lord, help me today as I handle your word. Keep me from error. Help me to say only what you want me to say, Lord. If there's something, Lord, if there's something you don't want me to say, please don't let me say it. If there's something, Lord, that I need to say that I I haven't even planned on saying, then I pray for a fresh filling of the Spirit. I pray that you'd guide my speech, and Lord, that you would free each and every one of us from distraction, and that we would hear from you that we would hear from you, that you would just give us like the attention span to hear your words being proclaimed today. We pray this in your great name. Amen and amen. So this is uh, part 49 of our journey through John's gospel. Um, If you're new here, uh, we employ a style of preaching known as expository. So if you're used to a topical sermon about faith or love or relationships or Christmas at the movies, or Halloween at the movies, or anything at the movies. We don't do that. Um, And one of the reasons is because when you're going verse by verse by verse, chapter by chapter, you're going to cover pretty much like every topic there is, but more importantly, it really protects you from taking verses out of context to be able to lean into the verses that come before and after the one you're actually looking at. So uh, this is the 49th sermon I will be preaching here in John's Gospel. We're in chapter 18. We're going to start in verse 12. Here's what's going on. Uh, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And his disciples just found out that Judas is the betrayer. Uh, They are surrounded by at least 200 Roman soldiers and a bunch of other uh, Jewish and religious leaders. And we pick up today in chapter 18, verse 12. It says, so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. So, if you notice, John tells us that Caiaphas is the current high priest. And then in the same exact breath, he says they took him to his father-in-law, Annas. So, if you're wondering like I was, if he's the high priest, what does his father-in-law have to do with any of this? Like, why take him to Annas? And the reason is, is because Annas is sort of like the godfather. He is the most powerful 
figure in the Jewish hierarchy at this time. He had actually been the former high priest before his son-in-law from 6 AD to 15 AD, at which point the Romans fired him. Uh, there was a guy named Valerius Gratus, that is Pontius Pilate's predecessor, and he disposed of him. But the way it works for high priests, it's sort of like former presidents. You're still former president so-and-so. You still get to keep the title. And oftentimes, with the title, you have lots of power, lots of influence. Like, Annas would have been sort of like a modern-day Barack Obama. He's not really the president anymore, but he has a lot of power and a lot of influence still. And this is all just, oh, by the way, another reason why the Jews resent the Romans for meddling in their religious affairs. And that is because, according to the Mosaic Law, according to Numbers chapter 35, 25, high priests are supposed to serve lifetime terms. But what the Romans would do is they'd come in and they would hire them and fire them whenever they wanted if the high priest didn't tow the company line, which is why this position really has evolved at this point into a less religious and more political one. As one commentator notes, Annas was in all probability the real power in the land, whatever the legal technicalities, end quote. And history has showed him to be a man who's very proud, a man who's very ambitious, and, and very greedy. And in fact, evidently a source of his income came from the concessions at the temple, which makes a lot more sense since Jesus cleansed the temple not once but twice in John 2 and Matthew 21. And so here's what, what would happen, speaking of Annas, his business operations. People would come to town, they'd come to Jerusalem to make sacrifices throughout the different times of the year. It is Passover right now, but there's other feasts and festivals that happen throughout the year, and people would make pilgrimages there, and oftentimes it would be easier when you're going to make sacrifices of different animals, it would be easier if you didn't have to bring the animal with you. If you could just buy the animal there in the city, especially if you're traveling from far away. So there was this really this big business opportunity. And so you come into the city, you go to buy an animal to make a sacrifice, and what Annas and the religious leaders would do is they would jack up all the prices, like movie theater style prices. But it didn't stop there. Some people would be like, all right, you know what? I'm not going to pay the exorbitant fees I'll just bring the animal with me, even if it's going to be super inconvenient. We'll, you know, we'll take the kids, we'll leave extra early so we can get there in time. But even that wouldn't prevent what was happening. And that's because, keep in mind, the priest had to approve of the animals. And if they didn't, you couldn't use the animal that you brought with you to make the sacrifices. And so the priest would regularly reject the animals. And they'd say, well, they have a blemish, or there's a problem, and you can't use those for sacrifices, even if the animals were actually fine. At which point, now the people are actually forced to pay the exorbitant prices of the animals being sold on site in the temple. And then Annas, on top of all that, he also basically ran their equivalent sort of as of an ATM machine. Because what he would do is he would take a profit of any money that had to be exchanged for foreign currency into Jewish currency. Which, oh, by the way, the temple tax, which every single dude, every single male had to pay, that had to be paid in Jewish currency. And so he'd just skim more off the top. So infamous was his greed that the outer courts of the temple, where the transactions took place, instead of calling them the outer courts, hey, we're, where's Connor and Rebecca and Jack? Oh, they're at the outer courts. They wouldn't call them the outer courts. They actually said, oh, they're over at the Bazaar of Annas. That's where they're at right now. Not only is he like the real power player at this time in the first century, but remember, Jesus has interrupted his business operations not once but twice. If that gives you any clue to maybe why they're also bringing him to Jesus, I'm sure he probably had a, a somewhat of a bone to pick with him prior to them bringing him to his son-in-law, Caiaphas. As verse 14 says, it was Caiaphas, that's his son-in-law, the current acting high priest, who would advise the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Enter Joseph Caiaphas. He had been appointed high priest in 18 A.D., by Valerius Gratus, that's Pontius Pilate's predecessor, the same Roman prefect that fired his father-in-law three years earlier. And Caiaphas came on the scene in 18 AD, and he would serve until 36 AD, when he eventually, too, got fired by the Romans. But his tenure was one of the longest in the first century, which I think really goes to show us his cunning and opportunistic nature. As verse 14 notes, the fact that he proposed killing Jesus goes to show that this is a guy who's willing to do just about anything to preserve his and the Sanhedrin's power. He was an incredibly ruthless person. 
Really, both of these guys are. Annas and his son-in-law, Joseph Caiaphas. In these guys, we see individuals of men who are supposed to be the example, but they're not. We see men who are supposed to be shepherds, but they're not. We see men who are supposed to care and exercise oversight for their people, but they're not. Remember, these guys are the current and former high priests. These guys are the highest ranking, most senior religious leaders. And if I didn't tell you that, you probably never would have guessed that by how they conducted themselves. Because Annas, he cares about money. He cares about overcharging his own people when they're effectively going to church, ripping them off. Caiaphas cares about holding power. He'll do whatever he has to do, including murder. I mean, these guys are ruthless. They both are. It's no wonder that Peter would later pin the following words addressing senior religious leaders. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5, he says this, So I exhort the elders among you. He's talking to religious leaders in the church. As a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock. Take care of the flock of God that is among you. Exercising oversight. Which means, in order to do that, you sort of need to know what's going on with the sheep. Otherwise, you can't take care of the sheep. You can't exercise oversight. Not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain. I'm talking to you, Annas. Not jacking up the prices, movie theater style. But eagerly. Not domineering. Not domineering. And or murdering people, Caiaphas. Over those in your charge. But be keeping an example to the flock. These guys aren't an example. These guys are a joke. They're a joke. I remember a couple of years ago talking to a young guy here at the church. And he had shared with me just how much he, he loved his home church. How, how instrumental his pastor at his home church had been in his life. Which I really found super encouraging. Because that just wasn't my experience growing up in the church. Maybe it was yours. That wasn't mine. And and this young guy is telling me that he's been at the church since he was a little boy, and I just thought it was super wonderful. I was like, that's awesome. And and so at that point, I asked him, I said, what, tell me about your relationship with you, like, what's your relationship with your your pastor? What's that like? Because he he said that the pastor had been very instrumental in his life, and at that point, he said, oh, um, I never actually met my pastor. He, he, wouldn't, he probably wouldn't know who I was. And so obviously, like, I'm super confused at this point. I'm like, I thought you said you've been going to the church for like 20 years. Well, I, I, I have, but it's a really big church. And I was like, oh, okay, I, that, that might make a little sense. I, I got that. So I was like, okay, big church, I got it. Tell me, maybe tell me about your relationship with maybe one of the other leaders or pastors of the church. And he was like, well, I, I don't really know any of them, but... The sermons are really good. Also, the praise team released a new album. I heard it on the radio last week. It's awesome. And I said very lovingly, brother, I, I love you, dude, but you're not part of a church. And he was really taken back. Um, he was like, maybe you didn't hear me. I, I've been going since I was a kid. I said, you've been going to a Christian conference since you were a kid. Which, I admit, it can be beneficial, especially depending on who's teaching at the Christian conference. But that's not a church. Like, when you want to see your pastor because you're going through something, or like you need to see your pastor, and the earliest appointment they can get you in and schedule you for is like 2038? You're you're not at a church, bro. You're at a Christian convention center. And unfortunately, too many people today think that's what church is supposed to be like. That's what church is supposed to look like. And that's just not accurate at all. And I'm not saying, let me be clear, that mega churches or mega church pastors are evil or wicked. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that. But you also need to understand the role of the pastors. Teaching. Yes, Very important, very vital, probably the most important thing that a pastor is doing. But you know what's also important? Shepherding. Shepherding is another responsibility that pastors have. That is knowing what's going on with the sheep, knowing the health of the sheep, knowing the injuries of the sheep, knowing the concerns of the sheep, being available to the sheep. And you cannot do that if you don't even have any interaction with your sheep. 
This is exactly what Caiaphas and Annas are not interested in. They do not care about the sheep. They do not care about their people. They care only about being like the big dog on campus, about having the, the big ministry, about being the big shots and preserving their big platforms and their power at any cost. This is exactly why the prophet Ezekiel rips into the failed shepherds of Israel, the failed pastors of Israel in Ezekiel 34, 2-4. He writes this, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. He's like, Ezekiel? Put all the religious leaders on blast right now. Okay, that's, that's God saying that. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds. Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not the shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. That's how God feels about these type of religious leaders. If you regularly watch all the tens and tens of you out there online, if you regularly watch, <laughs> if you regularly watch these sermons and you're like, wow, I really like these sermons or people send me reels or whatever, you know what, praise God for that. But let me just like get, offer some encouragement. Um, these sermons right now that you're watching online, they are no substitute for the local church. Amen. They're not. They are no substitute. Like praise God if you benefit from online sermons, Okay. You need to be a part of a local church. And there is a big difference between going to church and being a part of one. You can go to church for 15 or 20 years and never actually be a part of one. So here's my advice. Find yourself a local church that loves God, that loves his word, that cares about the preaching of the word 100%, but also cares about shepherding. That also cares about looking after their sheep and loving your soul. Not just creating a bigger ministry. Because loving you well and shepherding your soul is also a part of what pastors are supposed to do. And they cannot do that if they don't even know who you are. Watching online sermons, yes, they can be beneficial. But you need to be a part of a local church because there is a big difference between going to church and being a part of one. Verse 15, Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter, he stood outside the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest, he went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The, 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 the other disciple with Peter is, is most likely John. He never names himself in his gospel. And support from this comes from chapter 22 to 8. It's the only other passage in John's gospel where that phrase, other disciple, occurs. And it's there where the other disciple is clearly identified as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Chapter 20, verse 2. The disciple whom Jesus loved, John, is also associated with Peter in John 13, 23 to 24. And, and 21, 20 to 21. And in addition, according to the apocryphal uh, gospel of Hebrews, uh, the apostle John used to deliver fish to the high priest's house while he was working for his father's fishing business before uh, the Lord called him to follow him. And it's for that reason that many commentators believe that's how he's able to be known and have access and come in and out right now um, because they know who he is. And it says in verse 17, the servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. And if you remember back in John chapter 13, 37 to 38, a few chapters earlier, Peter told Jesus, I'll lay my life down for you. And Jesus responded in verse 38 of chapter 13. He said, will you? Will you, Peter? For real? Paraphrase. Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. And now here is the first denial that Christ predicted. Peter says, no way, I don't know the guy. No clue what you're referring to. Never heard of him. Verse 
Are you like him? Are you? Like how many of you intentionally, intentionally, you don't, you don't post Christian content on social media. How many guys, you, you don't bring up anything having to do with Christ at public or at work? How many guys, like you have friends and family members, they don't even know you're a Christian. And my guess is that if any of those questions are true for you, then, then you realize the same thing Peter does in this moment. And that is that there is a cost to following Christ. And in this moment, Peter views that cost as too high. Even though in chapter 13, he tells Jesus that there is no cost that would be too high. You, you see, so many people like Peter in chapter 13, they're excited to follow Jesus until they realize how expensive it can get. Many people, they are passionate for Christ until the pressures of this world give way like a dam breaking. In John 13, Peter's like, man, we ride together, we die together, Jesus. And now in John chapter 18, that confidence has all but been obliterated. Moral of the story, like Peter bragging about his own abilities, is an invitation to failure. Bragging about our own abilities is an invitation to failure. Peter's story is a warning to all of us who would claim self-confidently that we would follow Jesus wherever he leads them. Like, I certainly hope that's true for each and every one of us. The, the data just would suggest otherwise. And it's not that I'm trying to be cynical. I, I'm, I'm trying to keep it real. Because the number of people that have passed through this room in the 11 years I've been a pastor, the number of people who have passed through this local church, like I'm talking weddings that I've officiated, baptisms I've conducted, membership interviews I've overseen, and it's not just this church. Like I'm sure the data would reproduce itself in most other local churches. It's just staggering. And honestly, if you called some of those people up right now on the phone, they'd give you the same response that Peter is giving. I don't know the guy. I've never heard of the guy. I don't want anything to do with this guy, Jesus. Ministry is, is really hard, and seeing people that you care about deny Christ and walk away is really, really hard. Like, it's one thing to say that we love Christ. It's a whole other, uh, totally different game to continue saying it when it becomes costly to us. Which is why if we're going to boast... If we're going to brag, if we're going to run our mouths, we really should think twice about doing so, as Galatians 6.14 would say, but far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're going to brag, brag about Jesus, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world, or as James 4.15 and 16 would say, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that, as it is you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. If you're going to brag or boast, talk about how great Jesus is. Peter is going to be humbled by the end of the story, and far too many Christians are too. So far too many Christians, we, we talk a great game, we just don't actually show up to play when the metal meets the meat. We want to be the Christian of the year just so long as it's in our budget. Just so long as it's convenient. But the second that we're not feeling it, we're like, I'm out. And now the servants and the officers, they made a charcoal fire. That's interesting. Because it was cold. And they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. Understand, uh, Jerusalem is built on a mountain. Xavier, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you have that map of Jerusalem? Can you pull that up? If you can, awesome. If not, there it is right there. Perfect. There's Jerusalem, the time of Jesus. Approximately. It's in the ESV study Bible, which if you don't have one, they're great. But Jerusalem is built on the side of a mountain. It's on the edge of a desert. Uh, so that means uh, when the sun goes down, it gets cold. Okay, it gets really cold. This is happening March, April, month of Nisan. Um, it also can be kind of windy at night. So it's not surprising that if you're outside in the middle of the night, you're standing next to a fire. What's surprising, what's really interesting, is the specific reference to the charcoal fire. I don't think I've ever noticed that before. Charcoal fire. You know, charcoal fire, that reference only appears twice in the New Testament. Only twice. Very specific. This is one of the occurrences right here when Peter face plants in this epic failure in one other place. 
And the other place is in John chapter 21, verse 9, after the resurrection, after Peter's reinstatement by the Lord, after Jesus asked him, Peter, do you love me? Not once, not twice, but three times. In other words, I don't think it's any accident John decides to make this specific reference right now when Peter is at his lowest because he's going to make the same reference again in a few days when the story is redeemed. And so notice, Peter follows at a distance, okay? He follows at a distance. But you know, like, say what you want about Peter. At least he follows him. Like, like, where's everyone else other than John? And the reason I mention that is we have a tendency as a people to only remember the bad parts of the story, to only focus on the negative things that happen. It's true. And this is true whether you're having conflict with a friend or a significant other, to only see, to maybe only remember the bad moments, the negative things, like Peter. But what about the other times? Yeah, like Peter, he screws up. I get that. But you know what? At least he showed up. Like, at least he's brave enough to be there, which is braver than any of the other disciples minus John. Like, I I find this thing sort of annoying at times. So people will find out that I'm in the army. People find out that I'm an army officer. And they're like, oh, man, that's so cool. You're an army officer. Man, I love the army. The army is awesome. Where'd you go to basic training at? And I'm like, oh, you're you're in the army? Well, I I love the army. And I'm like, so... I'm sorry, are are you in the army? It sounds like you are. Well, it's complicated. I'm like, is it? Like, you you are, you're not. uh, And then they give me this really long story how how they were going to go into the army, but then they had some extenuating life circumstance. But man, if it wasn't for that, they would have been in the army. I mean, they played all the Call of Duty games, so basically we've done the same training. We're basically brothers in arms. And I'm like, that's not exactly how it works. Um, you, you either did or, or you didn't. You, you don't, like, get to, like, like make believe this, okay? You, you, you hold a rank or you don't hold a rank. You don't get to be Tim Walls and just make stuff up. <laughs> like, say what you want about Peter. At least he did. At least he did show up. He didn't just talk about showing up. He, he actually did. Like, yes, he tries and he fails, but you know what? At least he tries. Like, remember when Jesus is walking on water? Peter gets out of the boat, starts walking on water, and then sees the wind, sees the waves, gets really scared, starts to sink in. Jesus has to come and rescue him. He's like, Peter, your your little faith. And yet it's still more faith than the other guys in the boat who didn't get out. Like, I'm just trying to keep it real, guys. Like, I've been to the pool many times. I've never walked across it. Peter has little faith at times, but you know what? God can work with that. God can grow that. God can increase that. Like if you're here today and you struggle at times with your faith, that's okay. You can come out of the service. I'll talk to you. I'll pray for you. And the reason I know it's okay is because this is Peter's story. And oh, by the way, this is also the story in Mark's gospel, which is usually attributed to Peter, the man, with the, the son who was walking in the fire, going in the fire. And Jesus says, do you believe? He's like, yes, I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. Moral of the story, God can and does work to help us and grow us and increase the sort of faith for people like Peter whose faith might be small and it might be imperfect, but you know, praise God because he can work with that and he can grow that and praise God because if there is hope for Peter, that means there is hope for a whole lot of us as well in here who have imperfect faith. And so he says in verse 19, the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in the synagogues and the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me and what I said to them. They know what I said. Here's what's happening. The, the religious leaders, they have a very weak case against Jesus. And they know it. And so they start asking him these questions with the hope that he's going to incriminate himself. And if you've ever watched any type of like TV that has to do with lawyers, uh, you understand that there's protections against doing this. It's called the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. And actually in Jewish law, there was something very similar that prohibited and protected you from being forced to testify against yourself, which means what's happening here is illegal. It's illegal for them to be doing this. And of course, wouldn't you know that it was actually the responsibility of Annas to inform Jesus of the charges against him? Surprise. 
Verse 22, it says, When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? To clarify, striking a prisoner, especially one who has not been accused of a crime, is illegal. And oh, by the way, Jewish law forbade trying capital cases at night. So it's also illegal for them to even be meeting right now, by the way. And Jesus answered him in verse 23, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? It takes a lot of self-control for me when I hear people say dumb things. Maybe you're like me. I don't know. It takes a lot of self-control to maintain your composure when you're in a heightened emotional situation. It takes even more self-control when personally you are mistreated in a very unjust way. It takes even more self-control when you don't just get treated unjustly, but someone takes a swing at you. Like Jesus is going to demonstrate for all of us a great deal of self-control in this instance. Like he's going to exercise more self-control in this moment than the average person does when the ref blows a call against their favorite sports team. Okay, he is. Let alone when you're alone on your phone and no one can see what you're doing. Oh, that God might give us a fraction of the self-control that his son demonstrates in this moment. Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. What they are attempting to do was provoke Jesus, and that's because the issue here is they don't have anything on him except envy. And so they bring him in, they ask him some questions, they slap him around, they, they try to get him off. Try to provoke him. And it says in verse 25, Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, a a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? They've got him dead to rights. He's like, I watched you cut off my cousin's ear. Pretty sure, like, you've got the blood on on your robe. Yeah, it's you, okay? Peter, again, denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. Peter denies Christ for the third time, and he also lies for the third time. And the problem with lying is the same problem with sin in general. The more you do it, the easier it gets. Peter goes from, man, we ride together, we die together, to one lie, two lies, three lies. It's like those moments where the sin becomes sort of like the sinking sand and it just sucks you in and then you're having to sin more and more and more to cover the prior sin from the day before. And I wonder if we look really, really hard into our lives, what we would say if the question was raised. What sin has gotten easier for you because you've done it a few times? The truth is Sin gets easier the more you do it. With every subsequent time, we justify it or we become more numb to it. And understand, this isn't a Peter problem. This is a you and me problem. Peter has now, at this point, denied Jesus on three different occasions. He's evaluated the cost, and it's just too high right now. Which begs the question, at what point do you stop following Jesus? I don't know if you've ever thought about it. I want you to think about it right now. At what point do you, at what point would you stop following Jesus? Like if you're here today and you're a Christian, at what point do you no longer follow him? Put a number on it, right? This much money in my bank account? This much sex with this many women? At what point do you no longer follow him? Like how much would it have to cost you To abandon him. You see, for Peter, right now in this moment, he's deemed it too expensive. For Peter, right now, he's like, I don't like the price tag that I'm going to have to pay if I keep following Jesus. It's no longer budget friendly to follow Jesus. That the cost is too high with inflation, with Bidenomics. It's just not economical to follow Jesus. Let me be clear, I'm not asking 
you whether you believe in him. I'm asking if you, like Peter, have stopped following him or perhaps you are here today and you've been considering this very thing. And if you have, I'd remind you what Solomon says in Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. The, the, the fear of man is a snare. The, the fear of man is a trap. The fear of man is the opposite of the fear of God. And right now, Peter's afraid. He's afraid of harm. He's afraid of being arrested. He's just afraid. And for a lot of people, they fall in the same trap, in the same snare. They, they get into fear and that because if they follow Jesus, they, they might lose a friend or they might be rejected by a family member or someone might mock them or make fun of them. And maybe it costs them financially. Maybe it even costs them their job. Like in this moment, Peter has to decide if he's going to live in fear or by faith. And there are certain times where we face this dilemma. We're like talking to a person we meet, and internally we're like, man, I really should tell them about Jesus. I should give them a Bible. I should, I should invite them to church right now. I should try to swing the conversation to, to spiritual things right now. Here's my chance right now. And then fear sets in. What if, what if they get upset? Or, or what if I, I mess up? Or what if I can't answer maybe some of their questions? What I would recommend to you right now is that you figure this out now. That you decide now. That you make the decision now. What you're going to do before you find your